boo. How we do, folks? Welcome to episode three of Yogi Dave's Hobby Podcast. Um, I hope you have enjoyed episodes one and two. Um, I know they were released like a week apart, um, but I actually had episode two done a wee bit earlier. Uh, but I wanted you to leave a wee bit of space to see how many people actually listened to episode one before I released episode two. Um, <clears throat> or well or not. I would have Apple to actually fucking sort the shit out and, and get me uh, cleared before episode 2 was released um, um, at this point I'm actually not sure um, because I'm recording this not that long after I recorded episode 2 uh, but you know um, anyway, um, I'm Yogi Dave obviously, um, or David Muir um, I am your host um, I talk about gaming um, and all the things that are related to gaming um, and that is board games uh, RPGs and war games don't do any collectible card games or anything like that um, and I very rarely do any um, computer gaming anymore um, so a lot of this is me talking turning into rants um, and that will continue um, at some point I'm going to have some people on um, maybe friends of mine or maybe you know people that I know um, within gaming um, I'll have the odd interview episode or the odd talk in with other people episode but most of them is going to be me talking about various things in the hobby that I do uh, enjoy or drive me fucking crazy and there'll be lots of swearing because that's just who the fuck I am and I don't really care um, so first thing I'm going to talk about today is board games um, so when I talk about board games I don't just mean you know your, your regular run in the mill board games like Monopoly or Cluedo or anything like that you know that's, that's the mainstream board games I'm talking about um, stuff like Massive Darkness and Zombieside and Conan and, and Batman and all these cool ones as as well as what is more traditionally board gaming like Catan or Axis and Allies or you know stuff like that that's more like hobby orientated and that's not just that kind of what I class as board gaming isn't it's not like traditional board gaming because Cards Against Humanity is not a fucking board game really but I put it in that like section of my hobby um, even though it's, a, it's strictly speaking it's a card game um, but I, I stick that in my p- what I class as card games are um, well you get your traditional card games like poker and um, Jitnami and stuff like that but um, card games are like Magic the Gathering um, Keyforge, Pokemon you know those are the ones that I consider to be card games <clears throat> and I know I'm probably wrong and I know actually no, totally wrong um, but it's how my brain works these games in um, ooh, excuse me. Back in the day, I was very much not that big into board games. I had Hero Quest. My older brother had Space Crusade. Um, we had Advanced Hero Quest at some point. Somebody bought Advanced Hero Quest. I can't remember who. Um, um, you know, I'd, somebody bought me Classic Dungeon. We bought Battle Masters. Um, but that was really quite it for more of a game like a hobby um, board gaming obviously we had like Cluedo and Monopoly and these kinds of things but you know we didn't really play, play them very often and we had Buck Rogers those are Buck Rogers games the game that I stole all the fighters and stuff from for doing something else I can't remember what it was for. I think it was Star Trek to be honest with me. And um, when I started doing Star Trek Combat Simulator, because the battlers look like a little bit like fucking Morbugs. 
of Birds of Prey. Not too much, but a little bit. Um, anyway. Um, you know, we played them when we were younger. But, yeah, I mean, still own them. Though maybe not. Don't own Space Crusade that much, that much. We own parts of it. Because parts of it have been damaged. I admit, probably by me. Um, and the figures have been repurposed for other things uh, over the years. So, don't quite have Space Crusade anymore, but still got Hero Quest, still got Advanced Hero Quest. I think even Classic Dungeons kicking about stuff, um, though the figures have disappeared off the face of the bloody earth. Um, probably in a fucking landfill. Somewhere. Um, because I probably put them in a bin by mistake. Because I'm a fucking idiot sometimes. Um, but, you know, that part of the hobby kind of fell away. Um, after I did buy the war game, um, Doom of the Empire. And not Doom of the Empire, Doom of the Elder. You know, the one with the. Uh, is it High Fleet Kraken? Attacking a Lytic, the Craft World. I think that's. I did have that. Um, that was part of um, Games Workshop's War Game series of board games. I did own that. I forgot about that for a second. It's still in my mum and dad's house, actually. I might have to get that and see if all the parts of it so I can play a game at some point. Um, I'm, I'm getting off the point. But, um, yeah, so kind of fell away from board gaming until um, three years ago, I think. Might be four. Two years before I met Fiona. I think it was three years ago. Um, I got. I started doing Kickstarters. Um, and I got Conan. And I got um, Zombie Side the Black Plague. And I got uh, Massive Darkness. And all three of these are miniature board games. Uh, and they have different elements to them. That make them unique. Well, not absolute. Actually, I hate when people say s- absolutely unique. And unique is you, you can only say unique, and it's unique. There's no extremely unique or really unique or anything like that. It's unique. It is singular. There is nothing like it. To be fair, there is nothing like Massive Darkness because the set of rules that you use for Massive Darkness are the Massive Darkness rules. That's it. Nobody else uses them as far as I'm aware. Um, Zombicide, all of the Zombicide games kind of use the same system. Um, and then Conan has its own system. Now they're all based around their different varying types of rules. Um, I think Massive Darkness is very American. Um, Massive Darkness and um, Scott um, Zombie said, I think they're very much for the American market, whereas Conan's kind of a hybrid of, of different European um, types of board games, which it I like both. Well, actually, I like all three. I say both. I like all three. Games. I've only played a couple of games of Conan. I've played loads of games of Massive Darkness and quite a number of games of um, Zombie Side. But you know the game's different every time you play it because you flip different cards to get different. Or you know the way that one game of the Conan game will play one of each scenario plays out differently from the next completely. Um, even though you're using basically the same stuff. Um, it does, it plays out completely um, uniquely, it depends on who's been the, the, the game master kind of guy uh, in the Conan game how they play um, and how they, how they manage the, it's, it's very much managing their resources or, or their like monsters and what have you it's how you know how that game is played and how you know obviously the heroes games played how they manage their resources and what have you um, but you know, that was my first board games for 
at least 15 years. First time I had bought a board game in at least 15, maybe 20 years. <coughs> Excuse me, I have bad indigestion right now. I really should take an acid or drink a great big glass of milk. Um, but um, I'm recording this, so I'll get back, get to it in a minute. Um, so, about three or four months ago, um, I not actually it's longer than that. It's maybe about a year ago. I got um, Star Fox. I think I got it for Christmas last year. Um, because I'd played it at Falkirk and I had really enjoyed it so I wanted to get it so somebody bought me it for Christmas or my birthday I can't remember what um, and I played it with Fiona quite a bit um, and you know we really enjoyed playing that with each other um, and you know we're kind of on even scores and uh, and then I bought Tiny Epic Galaxies. Um, no, I, I think that was for my birthday. I got that, um, and I actually quite like that game. I quite enjoy that game. Um, I haven't played it properly, I don't think, so far, but I enjoyed it anyway. Um, but uh, not long ago, she was like, "Well, why don't you buy like this game and that game so so we can play it together?" So we got. Um, Cards Against Humanity and we got code names. Code names. Uh, we got both of them to play. Now Cards Against Humanity we never played until Christmas Day with her family and her brother in law's dad and sister. Um, and that was kind of, you know, eye opening um, about how bad at Cards Against Humanity can actually fucking be um, with people you don't expect it to be bad with. Um but I also got code names. We played that a couple of times. We played like a two-player game version of it, where you're playing against like uh, you're playing against um, you're not playing against like opponents, but you're playing against uh, a set a way of how the the opponent is AI'd. Um, and then we played a couple of games with her mum and dad and we got beat badly um, by them but we haven't really played it fully because what they recommend is you play three players um, in each team and then you know each player gets a, a shot at being the what do they call it the master spy, I think they call it the master spy. And and to, if you go on and watch tabletop code names, you'll yell. The, he, uh, Will Wheaton explains it, and the actual game explains it better than me trying to explain it to you. We got them, and we played them, and then for Christmas, we both got vouchers off our mum and dad. And Fiona was like, "Well, why don't we just go buy like a whole load of board games?" Um, so we bought Elder Sign, which was specifically for me. Um, and playing my mates because she's not particularly enamoured with the idea of that. Um, pardon me, I'm really, really sorry about this. But um, also, Pandemic and Forbidden Island. Now, all three of them. I suppose technically you could call them board games, but um, they're not really. Um, but obviously, Pandemic is a board game. Um, Forbidden Island, technically, you make the board up when you're putting it together um, and it comes apart. Oh. And the same could be said for um, Elders, Elder Sign, um, Elder Sign's the revised edition, and at some point in the near future, I will have an Elder Sign unboxing. Um, I did have one, but 
Zack in his infinite wisdom um, knocked the surface it was on and the camera um, the angle kind of went off it's my phone I use but it's a really good phone and that's why I use it um, for everything um, but um, yeah I've lost like half the half the footage is at a stupid bloody angle when I'm missing half the stuff I'm showing you so I'll have to redo that at some point in the future and get that uploaded um, onto the YouTube channel uh, and yeah so that is that's more of a dice game it's the different mechanics that I quite like having all these different mechanics different card mechanics now um, there's lots of games that have got card mechanics but there's different types of card mechanics it's like don't get me wrong um, for Bad Island and Pandemic fuck right um, have uh, pretty much the same mechanic because it's written by the same guy but it's done in a different way you know the the way things go are done in a different way and so obviously diseases are spread whereas when um, you play Forbidden Island parts of the island go underwater um, and then disappear which is not the same for um, Pandemic obviously um, and with you know obviously the other sign is Dice trying to get each you know part of the museum that you're in done you know, each going part it going through so you can get enough elder sign to stop the elder one from or ancient one from appearing and destroying the earth. Um but, but you know it's it's the variants of different ways that cards or dice or what have you can alter the game is what I enjoy about board gaming um, that I've started picking up um, I would like to pick up some uh, different ones other than this I would really love to have Lords of Waterdeep because even though I, I'll be honest with you I've watched Lords of Waterdeep and Elder Sign the tabletop episodes and I know lots of people love Felicia Day but she's fucking annoying in them um, and you know it sometimes puts me off watching an episode when I know she's on it but I've watched both of them and I still bought all the same and I still want loads of water deep so I know loads of you love Felicity but she's just so annoying sometimes it's just the way she talks and is over the top with things and shit and I'm just oh please shut up Anyway, I shall digress from that one. Um, yeah, so I'm really enjoying the board games, and because I am not allowed to buy any new mount figures, and I'm not allowed to buy any new terrain stuff, um, I think board games are going to be the things that are going to get bought for probably the next year, if not a little bit longer, um, as I try and cut down in the amount of projects that I have outstanding um, I need to build all my fucking trees um, so that actually segues into what I was wanting to talk about um, other than this um, is terrain now as you've probably listened to me talk about um, Lux APS Lucy PS is where I get my ideas for doing all my t I mean he's not the only place that I get the ideas from but he's the main place um, all I wanted to talk about was building your own terrain and how easy it can be and doing all your own stuff like um, yeah, so building your own terrain. Um, rather than going out and buying it. Now I know a lot of people I know a lot of people will go off and want at me for going oh don't but go out and buy terrain off people. No, 
Now, I know loads of people don't have the time to actually sit and make their own train, but, you know, I think it's important that if you can find the time to, to build your own train, it is do it. Um, you know, it's, it's not that difficult. It might look difficult, and sometimes I make it look difficult from the way that I do it, the way that I fuck up, but, you know, it's not, it really isn't, it's, it's just another, it, it's difficult to make it look really good, but it's like painting, it takes time to, to make it look good, and it takes effort, and it takes you trying lots of different things, and, and trying to do things different ways, to get it to look good, I mean, i do a mean hill, but a hill is not really that hard to do. It's a couple of bits of foam, some modelling compound, spread around it so it looks vaguely hellish, and then put some um, like fucking ground covering on it, and then put static grass over it, or foam grass, or whatever you're using for it, um, or um, sawdust flock or whatever whatever you're using to make your grass look you know, you put that over it it's not rocket science you can add a few stones or a few bushes or whatever you want to add to it but it really isn't that hard to make a hill it, it takes a bit of research, it takes a wee bit of money but not a huge amount of money because you can buy like styrofoam for um, 20 quid or something like that for big sheets of 2 by one actually not quite 2 by one but you can make any 2 by ones um, which I use to make my boards as well I, d I don't just make have just made my own terrain I've made my own boards like 2 by one boards to do like modular gaming a modular table so I can switch it about um, don't look that modular because my flocking is terrible um, but you know I think it looks good I think part of it looks good I think part of it looks fucking terrible but you know that's me that's me being self critical about myself but <clears throat> the thing is you know a lot of people in board gaming look at the like stuff the Games Workshop do and think, oh, I couldn't do that. Well, no. You probably couldn't do it right now. But in a couple of years, with a bit of experience and a bit of practice under your belt, then you probably could. And to be honest with you, you see the, um, some of the terrain the Games Workshop comes out with, or has come out with over the years, it's not that good. There's ways of doing better. Um... So, uh, I highly, I do really recommend that you look into it. Um, I don't recommend that if you're living in your mum and dad's house, um, you use all their crap. Uh, not their crap, but like their service and their, uh, <laughs> and their various other things to make terrain. Um, but always, if you, if you're under the age of. 18, always get the permission before you buy the stuff. If you think over the age of 18, I, I, sh I shouldn't laugh because I love my mom and dad for long enough. Um, get their permission to use your room as a as place of building your terrain um, or use the kitchen table or whatever you paint to build it um, but you know it's it's really good it's a really good thing to do don't try wire trees before you've tried tree armatures to make trees because that's just throwing yourself at the deep end and not expecting yourself to fail because um, trust me I made some hideous, hideous 
um, wire trees. One of them, which was binned in the latest um, portrait of my room, my, my hobby room, well, my and Fiona's hobby room, um, because it's so hideous. I actually managed to salvage some of the sea foam tree um, branch things that I'll use as bushes or something like that, or as 15 mil or 10 mil trees because they're probably big enough to be those size trees uh, on their own uh, but not big enough to be um, like proper war gaming trees like 28 mil trees um, Uh, the thing I would like to think talk about um, with building your own terrain um, is always be bloody safe. Um, watch yourself uh, with the knives and what have you, and the glue guns, and like any of the aerosol stuff that you might use. You know, always be careful with what you're doing with it um, because you know somebody can get hurt, and not just you. You know. If you've got younger siblings that are quite a number of years younger than you, or you know you've got nephews or nieces that are little, having blades lying about is not a good thing. So uh, having puppies about with blades is not the greatest thing on the planet. Trust me, I have a twelve-month-old puppy, um, and there's been a few times where I've been worried that a blade's pinged off and it might get stuck in his foot so you know be aware the other thing is also scale creep with terrain now <clears throat> you're never going to get a true scale tree um, in 28mm because a true scale tree especially for like pine trees and trees like the trees that are in your back garden or too big to put on a fucking gaming table you'd have like two trees and then very little else I've actually had a look at it myself um, but that, that the other thing is also like buildings and stuff if you're going to build buildings you probably can get away with a certain amount of true scale on it but it depends on the size of board you're using depends on what you're doing with it as well so like if I we've been talking with um, Dave Watson um, one of the guys in the, the Glasgow District War Gamers Club that I'm a member of about doing an Operation Sea Line um, what if um, the Germans obviously invaded England uh, and we've been talking about um, the buildings for it nobody does um, uh, World War Two era Br uh, English I was going to say British but English um, village buildings at this moment in time um, I've been looking at trying to teach myself to do 3D um, <coughs> software you know, try to build it myself um, but <laughs> all attempts at this point have um evaded me and actually being able to make anything um, I'm so busy with all stuff at the moment like this and the YouTube channel that I can actually <sighs> I can't really devote that much time to it um, hopefully I'll be going back to work very soon so I can devote even less time to it um, so it's, it's something you need to be aware of is the, the size the scale creep um, you want to be have it as close as you can but without it looking stupid or look, having it look out of place on your table so I've got a whole bunch of outcrops um, that are quite large but eh, if I was putting them on a, um, an 8 before and a, like a, a craggy um, terrain they wouldn't look out of place because they're not too big but they're not too small um, so 
you know they're kind of exactly right for the size and that's that was a happy accident because it was using the expanding foam to make on um, um, bacon bacon trays bacon sheets with the, the bacon paper that's it bacon paper um, sheet just like squished out along a big ro long roll of that um, bacon paper that's the bloody word I was looking for um, yes squished all along that um, and it just pulled off Um the other thing is, now, not everyone's got enough money to start out doing this, but if you can afford a static grass um, box um, or applicator, like a good, decent version of it, making your, see your bushes and your flower um, plot pack, ugh. For flower plants and what have the you can put on your bases buy one of them instead of going out and buying the pre-made stuff because it will be a lot cheaper in the long run so you just put your and um, there's lots of videos that explain how to do it but um, that I would recommend that if you can afford to buy one of them buy one um, outright Right away, I wish I could have. I wish I knew about it, and wish I could have bought one right away. And um, I think I might have to actually get somebody to buy one for me for my Christmas, for my birthday in March. Um, since I'm not getting any new toys, I might as well get that kind of toy. Um, though if you want, it might kill me. Um, maybe, maybe not. Um, she might be all right with it because it's not actually me buying. A toy, or a bit of terrain stuff, or making bits of terrain, because uh, I, I need to finish lots and lots and lots of different projects. But um, yeah, so um, if you're going to do it, plan it. Don't honestly, I am the worst kind of um, impulse war gamer. Um, I buy stuff on impulse all the time. Um, if I was a gambler, I'd be, I would be fucked. I'm on honestly, I've got so much impulse um, control issues when it comes to gaming. That is ridiculous. Um, I've gone and bought like two fleets for dystopian wars and, and banged them out, um, like as big a fleet as I can possibly pick up. Um, right away um, when I did the US Marine no I shouldn't Marines US Army for World War 2 I bought shit loads of stuff um, without realising I didn't need that much stuff I have a whole platoon worth of figures that's actually going to get painted um, for the YouTube channel to raffle off for people to help with actually the podcast and the YouTube channel um, and keep it afloat. Um, what else? Uh, all my Space Wolves. When I was rebuilding my Space Wolf army um, for 40k, I bought shitloads. I have more Terminators than I would ever need. I swear to God. I have more friggin' um, 30k and 40k infantry than I would ever need for any one game um, I've got like 15 bikes or something like that not including my attack bikes I've got 30 oh, sky claws though no, I have uses for 30 sky claws it's fun um, but yeah I have that problem that I start doing I start buying all this stuff I don't actually finish it. Oh, I have like 40 trees and about three of them are finished. And that doesn't include that. I mean, that's the ones that have been made from amateurs. I've still got about 
Or maybe not 40, but at least 20. Still a build. I'm looking at them going, whoa. But I built loads of hills. I built, built a big, massive river. Um, but there's three sections. Actually, five sections that don't actually. I've used resin to do the surface. But I missed a bit in the middle. Um, and I can't afford to go out and buy the resin right now. Um, and also, it's not the weather for the resin that I use because it stings like high fucking heaven and I can't do it outside um, but yeah honestly plan out what you're going to do before you start doing it with terrain because you will get carried away I am so carried away that it's ridiculous I've spent I only started um, doing it in October yeah October I probably spent about 600 quid on stuff maybe a wee bit before that maybe September or August I can't remember to be honest but it was, it was it's less than 6 months and I've, I've easily spent about 6 or 700 quid for the stuff and it's scary it really is Um. I'm probably exaggerating a bit, but it's not by a lot um, that I'm exaggerating. But just there's just so much stuff that I've started doing, and I've got like trees, and I've got um, hills, and I've got outcrops, and I've got what have you that are, that are finished. But everything else I need to finish. Just like so much stuff, um, and I'm, I've started doing stuff for Naked Monday as well, but um, that I can use for 40k. But, you know, I need to finish that off too. I need to figure out what I want to do with it, to be honest. Um, because I want to make it look really good, but I'm trying to figure out a way of making it look really good. And that's the problem. I'm trying to make it look really good. <laughs> you don't have a fucking clue what you're doing. Mm, it's funny. I find it funny. Anyway. Um, what else was I going to talk about? I was going to talk about lots and lots and lots and lots of things. Um, what was the one? I, I was, I was thinking about uh, RPGs again. Um, I know I talked a lot about two D twenty um, RPGs the other day on the other pod, the other podcast. It is actually the other day now because um, I recorded it yesterday morning. Um, I'll put half bloody two. Um, recording this <sighs> so I was talking about the 2D20 um, system of RPGs and I also talked a little about a bit about Through the Breach um, and I think I was probably a little bit harsh on, on Weird and uh, I thought that the the scheduling and the release in the second edition was a little bit much in the short period that they did it um, but you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, I, I honestly don't know what I'm talking about when I when I talk about these things. Sometimes it's like it's just something that pops into my head and I see it. Um, but you know, I I've been RPGing for years and years and years and years. Well, on and off, anyway. Um, but you know I went from 2nd edition I mean 2nd edition D&D was around for a long time some people call it 2nd AD&D some people call it 2nd edition AD&D I, I just go with it was whole 2nd edition D&D um, So second edition eight D and D D was you know what I started with when it comes to um, Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so you've got different updated versions. Um, so nineteen eighty seven. You're talking second edition AD&D. Um, 
and it wasn't until 2000, you know, the year 2000, they released the third edition of the D&D. So you think about it, it went from 1987 to 2000, that is 13 years. That's a long time for a wanted single edition of a game. Not so much for an RPG, I don't think, um, from, you know, thinking about it, because there's a lot you can do with an RPG, um, especially one like Dungeons & Dragons. But that's Dungeons & Dragons, because Dungeons & Dragons has so many different settings. You know, you've got Faerun, you've got Greyhawk, you've got Eberron, you've got... Um, Crying, Kyron. I can never remember what the Dragon Lance, how how you pronounce the Dragon Lance one. I, I never really knew. I, I said Crying or Kyron at times. Um, you know, but you know these are like the the main ones really. Um, where I, and you've got other ones. You know, you get uh, the Ravenloft one. You've got um, Dark Sun. Um, you get Planescape, you know, there, there's loads of them, there's loads of different ones. Um, so that allowed D D TSR, and then <coughs> I'm not sure whether or not um, third edition came out long after Hasbro bought the company uh, or bought the the rights. To Dungeons and Dragons, obviously Wizards of the Coast release Wizards of the, um, Dungeons and Dragons, but Wizards of the Coast is owned by Hasbro, so you know, and, and they released the D twenty set of rules, and then later on did the three point five version, um, and fourth edition. You know, th there's a lot more editions in the last seventeen years, no, nineteen years, um than there had been in the previous 13. You know, obviously, the previous 13, there was a single edition of AD&D. &D. And then, you know, 19 years later, we've had the third edition, 3.5, fourth and fifth. So we've had four different editions. And, and <coughs> that, I think, has a lot to do with, you know, the increased need of the gamer um, for additional information um, uh, has gone to the point where okay, we need to redo and do fourth edition, um, and then obviously in the time between fourth edition and fifth edition, they've they've soaked up all that other stuff, so they're doing fifth edition, um, you know, so it does, you know, take a lot less time to go through everything now, so it takes uh, a lot less time to go through all of the. Um, settings now but you know the thing with that is they have all those settings you know weird and you know all these other companies don't really have that but um, to be honest I don't think with the two D20 systems um, there'll be like new additions I think there'll be reprints with errata and updated stuff um, so if you've already bought like the PDF version of the rulebook, you know you won't have to go out and buy a new rulebook because there's a lot of changes all the time, um, and obviously they get up. You know when you buy the PDF version, you get the updated version. So you know, um, I don't think um, you know going by the the um, D and D model, you you really can. <coughs> you really can go through, you know, and go, well, weird took this short amount of time to switch over because, you know, they wanted to make more money. It might be that they wanted to make more money. It might just be that they decided, right, um, all this stuff that's happened, what us doing, all, all the through the breach stuff up until now has made it so that we think actually what we need to do is update this class, update that class um, or path as they call it 
Um, I'm sure it's a path. I don't have my copy to hand, but um, all these things need to get updated. Um, the spells as well, um, and, and everything. And you know, it's, it's, it hasn't changed a massive amount, but it's changed enough that they probably did need to bring out a new edition. Um, I don't know. I, I get a little wary of bad mouthing people um, and companies because you know I play the games. I, I understand that you know there might be reasons for it, but you know I say what I think and I think what I feel. Uh, and sometimes it's going to get me into trouble, but that's fine. Because that's life. That's what happens in life. You, you say things that will get you into trouble, and there's no point in backpedaling, but there's also no point in not telling, telling it how it is. Because if you don't, you know, it's not going to not gonna help you in life. As far as I'm concerned, anyway. Uh, but, um, I'm rambling on now. Um, what are we going to talk about next? So there's the whole um, resolution for 2019 thing. Now I did it. Right? I, I've said I'm not going to buy any more figures until such point that you know I can actually say that I, I put a big dent in my paint collection, apart from the um, conquest stuff because obviously that's going on something else. That's that's being used as a big raffle army uh, for the the Storm Modern Space Marine one. Anyway, um, you know, but that's also getting me all that terrain and all the all the scatter stuff, which you know I quite like the idea of um, having all that stuff. But at the same time, you know. I'm being realistic. I only have so much time over the year that I can play war games. Yeah, I mean, there's last year I missed half of the um, Glasgow Club meetings because I had work or the life events happened. And, you know, when life happens, you can't game. It's just how it is. Um, and, you know, there's only so much time I can spend painting. There's only so much time I can spend, you know, not with, you know, my family and friends and all the rest of that kind of stuff that is outside the gaming. So, you know, I was being realistic when I made that particular um resolution uh, and there's also that um, I'm going to try to play more games try to get more people into gaming but that's kind of always part of what I want to do over a year I always want to play more games more different games bring more people in it you know get more people playing whatever games I play that kind of things it's, it's kind of a given with me you know I go to shows every every year, you know, I'll, I'll be going to the Carronade in Falkirk um, Claymore in Edinburgh um, even though I hate certain people up there um, I hate dealing with certain people up there, fucking drive me insane I wanted to punch one guy once old bastard treat me as if I was a fucking Wayne and this is when I was like 30 you know I don't, I don't appreciate, I never really appreciated getting talked down to when I was a, was a kid and, and a teenager. I really don't appreciate it now that I'm a bloody adult. Um, but that guy's a bit of an asshole anyway, as far as I'm aware. So, it's fine. Um, but, you know, I'll be going there and hopefully I'll be going to the Glasgow G3 gathering. Um, so, um, Try and get stuff done for that particular um, show. Want to either take some Napoleonics and do some sharps practice, 
or I want to take along some board games, um, some miniature board games, um, like Conan or um, something like that. Or if somebody else wants to do something, I'm quite happy to, you know, help out. But, you know, it's important to be involved in the hobby. Not just as a player, but, you know, as somebody that actively tries to help the hobby. That is my opinion. It's obviously not everyone's opinion and that's you know I understand that um, and you know I love the way I do you know hobby wise because you know I, I don't want to not have opponents to play anything I want to play I, I don't want to not you know get to play something because there's nobody to do it with um, it's just my mindset on that um, and I just I don't understand people that don't have that mindset but I do because there's people I know that have anxiety issues that you know aren't particularly good at um, interacting with other people except when it's you know playing the game they can interact with them when they're doing that but they have to do it through Facebook or whatever like that, um, otherwise um, but, you know I also know people with extreme anxiety and issues that are great at teaching people how to play new games bringing people in and teaching them how to play it um, <clears throat> but, you know I don't know where I was going with that one but you know, the, the whole resolution thing it's like making New Year's resolutions otherwise, you know, there's there's a point where you're going to break it, or the thing is, what you say is, I'm going to try my best, you never say, I'm going to do this, you always say, I'm going to try my best to not do this, or to do this, or to do that, or the next thing is never, I'm going to, so I am going to try my best to paint as many figures as I can this year, I'm going to try my best to play as many more games as I can next year and play with as many different people as I can ne this year um, the thing with the, the, the figures is I've actually got to the point where I'm like right unless it's absolutely necessary for me to do, do this that or the next thing I'm not going to buy it so my jeans still are cult um, I'm not buying any figures for it until um, such point as I actually start getting it painted, which will be some point next year. So it is, it's January, and already it's going to be some. I know it's going to be some point next year because I've got other stuff to do before then. I've got space minions to do. I've got space wolves to do. I've got storm orders to do. I've got massive darkness to do. I've got um, the Napoleonics to do. Um, I've got. Uh, other projects that I'll have to get done uh, clients projects that need to get done you know it's, it's not going to be a, a quiet year painting wise for me it's not going to be a, a quite an open year for me that I can just sit back and do whatever the hell I like um, with my painting that I can't uh, there's also my terrain projects that need to be finished you know so I don't have that time to go and sit and paint gene steels because the thing about the gene steels is they're going to be part of a, a split army so it'll be chaos um, imperial guard and chaos cult so they'll all be kind of all the figures will be of the same paint scheme um, so if you've seen my goliath my necromunda goliath they are going to be part of that and they are all you know yellow and red and uh, greeny blue or bluey green depending on how you look at it you know um, so that's every figure in the army is going to be which means I have to re I have to strip my jeans to a cult um, figures so you know it's, it's all going to be one big massive army um, with chaos cultists mm -hmm. with chaos marines 
with you know the Jeans to the Cult, with the Imperial Guard, with Necromunda stuff. Um, I'm gonna have you know mid, um, feudal Imperial Guard, um, among others stuff that I have had for Warzone, like the Warzone um, plastics. That's going to be painted as you know the Tempest, the Scions of this particular army, um, but they could also be used as you know, obviously, um, traitor guard scions or stormtroopers or whatever you want to call them, um, veterans or what have you. Uh, so, you know, it's not going to be a little project, it is a year long project, and it's slated for next year already. I already have plans. But, you know, I'm flexible enough that I know things are going to get in the way of me doing this. Things are getting me in, going to get me in the way of me doing that. Uh, and I've, you know, I'm ready for that. that. That's the thing. When you make these kind of, you know, predictions and resolutions and stuff, you have to be able to um, roll with the punches. You have to be able to um, deal with the fact that you might not get that done. You might get it done, but there's no um, guarantee that it's going to happen. So um, that's that's that little bit. Oh, God. another thing I was want to talk about was is, um, you know the the rebirth of the specialist games for Games Workshop. Now, if you're as old as me, you remember back in the day where Games Workshop would just release a game um, like Blood Bowl back in the day, like Dark Future, like the Titanicus, Epic Space Marine. Everything went into White Dwarf and everything was in White Dwarf, you know, it wouldn't matter. You know, there was a bit Warhammer Roleplay, Warhammer 40k, you know, everything was in there. Um, and then, you know, Battlefield Gothic, I think it was when Necromunda first came out that, you know, they started, well, it was actually long before that, they stopped doing anybody else's stuff, but, you know, when it, they got to a point where it was like, right, we've got too much stuff for us to keep going and putting everything in White Dwarf all the time. Um, but it's got to the point where you're like, when they shut down specialist games, um, there was no support for anything, um, you know, we all had to support each other in that, uh, and I think that's quite important um, to remember. Um, and I, I think it's quite important for Games Workshop to remember that all these games that they've had in the past, um, there's as communities out there. Um, obviously, Adeptus Titanicus, when it came back, it was a massive hit. Um, you know, Necromunda's been a bit of a hit, but it's also been a bit of a miss. You know, it, it dips in and out of popularity. Um, with people the the thing is you know you keep on running out of gangs you know I keep on I keep on seeing on element games all the stuff that you need keeps on like the gang cards you know your tactic cards and the dice and everything they keep on going out of um, out of stock and not being able to get unavailable to get you know, it's not helping. It's not helping keep the games alive. Obviously, they've got a release schedule, um, and they have to, you know, redo them, reject the system, whatever they have to do with them. But it's not helping. Um, the bring in new players it's not helping bring and keep the older players you know I, I've heard a lot of complaints about the fact that you know people have gone out and bought all the gang war books and then you know when the Dalak game comes out you know we've got a brand new rule book and we've got uh, you know we've got two new rule books that you've got going by they've got everything in it 
but if you want the deluxe and the stuff that comes with that um, you have to go out and buy the new books. that's not helpful I know it's not from what I've read it's not really Games Workshop's fault because the guy who was um, the lead on Necromunda left very close um, to release and wouldn't you know Games Workshop wouldn't give him a contract for um, what's the what's the word consultant wouldn't give him a consultant contract because Games Workshop do not, don't do that Game, Games Workshop you know if, if you want to work on or work with them you have to work for them you have to work directly for them and I'm pretty sure that they don't like you work for anyone else <coughs> unless you know obviously you're a black library um, writer like Andy Chambers and Gavin Thornton people who have been there a long long time or been been with Games Workshop at some point uh, and worked on lots of different things they're quite happy to you know have you do whatever you want just as long as you get the stuff that they need you to do on time um, but you know, I think that's a lesson that has to be learned with game uh, with well, for you, Slay Necromunda, um, you can't have that with Titanicus. Um, if they bring a version of More Time back, um, if they do Battle for Gothic again, you know, you know, Blood Bowl's been slightly the same. Though I think Blood Bowl was always planned to would release the main rules and then do everything through Forge World after that um, but I'm not sure on that you know I can't I can't speak for Games Workshop and I can't I can't be clairvoyant and go well this is what their idea was but you know you have to learn the lessons from Necromunda and Blood Bowl that there is a vocal community that has kept these games alive when Games Workshop haven't been doing shit with them um, and you need to as much as you need to bring in those old those new players you also have to understand the feelings of the older players that they want to come back and have this new game and enjoy it And um, I mean I'm running a campaign for, for Necromunda this year um, but there's the, everyone Apart from two or three, um, never played the original. Um, so, you know, they are new players, but it's bringing in the old players that was difficult. Um, I, we did the campaign at um, the club a number of years ago, when I came under, um, and, you know, none of those players wanted to take part because. I don't know. I don't know why they didn't want to take part. I've not asked them because I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's my place to go. Well, why don't you want to take part in my campaign? You don't want. I mean, I mean, that's the thing. I run the campaign. I don't care if you don't want to take part in it. Don't take part in it. That's fine. I don't have an issue with that. Um, I would like to have had them play in it because there'd have been more players, uh, and we could have. You know, extended it a little bit better and fleshed out a bit more, but you know, I can live with it. It's just, you know, who who plays is who plays. That's fine. Um, but I do, I honestly do believe that the thing with bringing back the specialist games is you have to bring them back back properly. You can't just bring them back, you know, willy nilly, with no, you know, regard for the community. Um, you know, I I do know, I think, well, I think, I don't know, for sure, but I do think there are people who were who are part of Yak Tribe, which is obviously the the big um, Necromunda website. It's also got more time stuff. And, um, Gorka Morka and 
a, a lot of specialist game stuff is on that website. Um, I do I believe that you know they've had a hand in bringing the the new game to life, but I don't know how much, um, and I don't know if it's you know it's been a smooth trajectory, smooth smooth sailing. Um, I don't even know what I'm trying to say there. But, um, you know, I think having and keeping the the community that still plays these games um, involved is an important thing um, to get the new edition that you bring out and bring it forward and bring it, you know, into the community as a whole, like the the gaming community as a whole, and have it accepted and played, and you know, I, the thing is with these figures, you know, Games Workshop can't like be spending a small amount of money because the the um the molds aren't cheap on plastic. Even if Games Workshop did it all in house, it still wouldn't be cheap. Because um, it takes time and money to get these created, um, it takes a, an engineer um, of some skill, as far as I'm aware, um, to put one of these molds together. Um, and you know, with the gangs for Necromunda, there's a lot of them, and it can't have been cheap. You know, the the molding can't have been cheap. Um, let alone how much money they spent on um, advertising. Now I know probably a lot of the stuff that they did are in house, but not everything they could have done was in house. You know what I mean? Um, so you know, th- it's got to make money, obviously. Um, but you know, you, you can't really think the Games Workshop have gone out to tank their own game you know um, there might be elements within the um, company that might want to tank it because they might want more money assigned to whatever project they work on or you know th- this happens in big companies um, but you know it, from my limited experience with people who work in game, Games Workshop because obviously I haven't spent a lot of time in the shop in the last probably 10 years maybe 15 years, it's been a long time since I've spent a lot of time in a games workshop and even when I did spend any amount of time in a games workshop it wasn't a lot Um, which is probably one of the reasons I never got a job that I applied for with them but you know I'm still a bit of a fucker about it still I always will be I always get on my bloody nerves um, but you know that's beside the point entirely um, the thing is there's a lot of money being spent on it so they need to make their money back but they need to support it properly that's the thing if if you're ever going to run your own games company um, run you know games and create games is You've got to support it. It's one of the biggest problems Spartan had, um, which I believe is one of the reasons that they went under, um, is they did not support their games properly. They would release this new set of rules and support it for about six months and then it fall off. Support would fall away because they'd go do something else. And then it was a cycle with them. Support it for six months and then fall off. And even at the end, the support was less than six months. You know, obviously they released a lot of the Halo stuff in the the latter days, and I think they've spent too much on the license. Games Workshop have done that before, um, from what I heard. With the Lord of the Rings um, license, was it wasn't until very near the end of the original. Um, run 
of their license deal with New Line. I think it was New Line, can't remember. Um, they started making a profit off the um, license. I don't know how true that is. It's the same as the, um, you know, at the time where it first came out, I knew a few people that worked for Game Workshop, or knew people who worked for Game Workshop down in the, the head office down in Nottingham or Lenton or wherever it is now um, and you know they talked you know you talk to your friends especially ones that are in the you know the community about stuff that happens if you work for a game company and basically part of the license was you know they can't be the same size as the Warhammer figures because people just use Warhammer figures for playing Lord of the Rings so if they're all the same scale uh, and if they're all different scales you know the original um, Lord of the Rings stuff I don't know how it is now because I've not bought any in a while long while because I've sold most of the stuff that I've got um, is true 25s so you know it's not 28s it's, it's closer to true 25s than it is 28s um, so there is a big difference in size and build and all the rest of that kind of stuff um, and actually the um, Lord of the Rings stuff is closer at reality size like build and stuff like that than the, the 40k stuff because obviously 40k stuff and Warhammer stuff is exaggerated um, but you know, that had to be a a difference. You know, the different way of sculpting them, different way. You know, because obviously all of their um, mold making stuff would be tooled towards making twenty eights rather than twenty fives. I don't know how much a, a massive difference that makes, but you know, I'm sure it will be a hard being a difference. And sculpting to that size as well would have been different because. Uh, it's, it might only be three millimeters off to your eye, but it's you know when it's three ups and ten ups and all this that kind of stuff, it's massive difference between that and that. So you know, but you know there there was that rumor that it wasn't on you know so that it wasn't until very near the end of the license they, they made the money so. I can only imagine the kind of money that Spartan paid for the Halo franchise license. Can it be cheap? Um, and maybe they overextended themselves. But their biggest problem was not supporting their games properly. And it's something you have to learn. I think if you're going to be a developer of games, is oh, do not overextend yourself. Do not spend too much money on a license if you're going to license stuff, um, if you can't afford it. And also, um, you know, support everything that you do. I think that's that's important for anyone in the gaming industry. Support what you're doing. Because, you know, people are only going to buy it if it's being supported. People, people will buy it initially, but once it stops being supported nobody's going to buy it um, and I think that's that's the thing that you have to get in your head if you're going to do that kind of sim thing and I, I might be rambling a little bit just now because I'm trying to think of what else I was going to say um, so oh yeah I'll, I remember what it was now it's, if you are going to do a game right and you're going to put it on video or are you going to do um, battle reports or anything like that learn the fucking rules this is one thing I have learned from doing them myself I don't remember the bloody rules for 40k I don't remember the rules for kill team I definitely didn't even remember the rules for when I was doing um, a song ice and fire game um, so you know to be honest with you if you're going to play it all, 
learn the rules before you do it. I mean, the thing is, with a lot of sets of rules, you know, it's it's not apparent the the nuances until you actually play a game. It doesn't sing it kin until you play a game. But what you have to do first is actually sit and read the rules. Sit and sit and take your time. Go through the rules, check them, um, and make sure that you've got it right. Because there's nothing worse than having to stop mid-game um, and go, oh, I don't remember that rule, I don't remember this rule. Especially if you've got it on video. Makes you look like a complete and utter fucking tube. Guilty of that one. Several times. Um, but, you know... As I said, you know, a lot of the time actually picking up the rules properly doesn't happen until you go and play the game and then you go back and reread the rules. And like, right, okay, understand that, understand that, understand that. It sticks. Um, it helps to have, you know, a player around that remembers everything um, once it's committed to memory. Um, we've got Sam and the Falkirk uh, group that, you know, once he's got it, it's committed to memory and, you know, all you have to do is check them. Um, but one, as I say, once it is committed to memory, he remembers it, but, you know, he can't, um, if he doesn't remember it, it's, it's because he hasn't, it hasn't come up in a game, so he has to go back and look at it and then it sticks in there. I wish I had that. I really do. Because it drives me crazy. Playing a game and I can't remember shit. Um, though, to be fair, it happens very often that I can't remember shit anyway. Because um, I have dyspraxia and I have absolute horrific memory at times. Um, there's no excuse for some it sometimes. It's just that I haven't bothered um, remembering to read something or haven't bothered actually learning something properly um, and that you know it's fine but you need to get your finger out and um, read those rules before you do anything um, when I was doing an uh, uh, unboxing of a set of rules <laughs> I completely forgot the rules so I had to actually have the rules there with me and I was actually saying things wrong every time even though I've got the rules right in front of me so obviously I hadn't read them well enough um, in order to get my point across so before I do that again because it got ruined thank you Zeki boy um, I will have to read the rules again and, uh, and at that point you know, obviously I'll be ready to do it again. Um, but right now, not ready to do it again. Um, today at some point, is, this is Monday um, now, uh, there will be another YouTube video released. It is, oh, it's actually been released. I haven't watched it yet. Um, or haven't um, tweeted or anything about it so I actually need to do that um, that's the thing also if you're going to be a YouTuber uh, podcaster and any anything like that you need to remember to um, put tweets out you know Facebook messages Instagram messages everything on your social me media um, you have to get it out so people can watch it and see it and see what's going on on your channels you know um, when I first released n uh, episode number one it was out like that but it was a stupid time in the morning so I don't think a lot of people got it so um, I had to send it out again that's the thing you have to if you're in the UK, you have to send it out as an appropriate time for the UK, but also appropriate time for America and Europe. Um, so 
at like two o'clock in the afternoon here it is what a six o'clock in Los Angeles so you know you need to keep saying that to be out at like eight o'clock in the morning maybe so people are getting it when they're, they're getting up and getting ready to go to work um, so you're talking four o'clock in the afternoon before you send all that stuff out well I could send it out now and people would get it but you know we'll see I shall see um, but yeah I think that's it for me today I think I've talked a lot it's in around 20 minutes odd um, so I'm going to try and get the YouTube on a better schedule um, than I've got it on just now right now it's just it's higgledy piggled days whenever I've got time to get that out it gets out um, and this will probably for the start will be once a week um, but I'll see how I feel when I've finished them all um, so I am going to say a good day and happy hobby um, actually before I go um, obviously I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I hope, hope you've enjoyed the previous two episodes obviously if you've enjoyed one episode and listened to it and kept on listening you have enjoyed it um, this channel is ad free at the moment because obviously I don't have any support that you add support um, I'd like to keep that um, cap, keep it like that as long as possible um, I don't do Patreon because I don't like the idea of me charging you for anything that I do I'd like to think that if you would support me um, you would do it because you want to um, so on the website for the podcast um, it's somewhere you can find it um, there is a link for to my coffee account now you know you don't need to give a lot of money two or three pounds dollars whatever it is it would buy you one less coffee for yourself, I don't buy. Co- I don't drink coffee, but you know, it's, it's a. I think it's a good system. Um, so basically, what that plan is to do with the first lot of that money that I get is to um, buy a new mic for doing YouTube, but also doing this, doing the podcast, and doing Twitch when I can actually finally do Twitch. Um, right now my um, internet is complete garbage so I can't do it um, but also help me with my lighting rig because right now it's garbage um, yeah so basically if you want to support the channel go to yogi daves hobby dot podient dot co um, I think that's it hold on I'll check it because I'm friggin' useless when remembering these things. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, so uh, Yogi Dave's Hobby dot podient dot co, um, and on there somewhere there is a link to my coffee account. Um, so a couple of pound or a couple of dollars will help me out eventually when I get the money. Um, but it'll keep me going, keep my YouTube going, keep, you know. Obviously, um, if you've got, gone and watched the YouTube, you know at some point I'm going to be doing some raffles for a couple of pounds. So that, what I'd ask is, if you're going to um, do a coffee, um, that'll be how I do the raffle. So, um if you spend three pound or three dollars or three pound, I think it was it was either two pound or three pound. I'm not 100 percent sure. But every, I think to be honest, it'll be two pounds. For every two pound, you'll get a raffle ticket, um, and you know you'll be able to win. 
you just get entered into whatever raffle is running at that particular time. Um, so the first one will be a painted version of Captain Calcius from um, Conquest on a display base um, that I've made myself. Um, and I'll, you know, if you want it, I'll get sent out to you and, you know, that, if, if you give, if you pay for coffee now, you'll just get entered into that. And everyone that you give me, you'll get entered into that period's um, raffle. So, you know, you're not getting something for nothing if you win. <laughs> but you're not getting some, something for nothing anyway because, you know, it's helping support the podcast, the YouTube channel, and eventually a Twitch channel. So I'm not going looking for advertisers and having to, you know, mess about with all that nonsense. Um, so, as I said, um, I hope you enjoy. I hope you continue to enjoy. And I hope you come back again. Um, so, again, I'm going to say good day, happy hobby.